ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the first morning session of the second week. Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce Alexei Borodin from MIT now. So Alexei has obtained his PhD at the University of Pennsylvania and he has later held positions at Caltech and now at MIT. His research has been distinguished by various awards and honors. Um, I would just like to mention a Clay Research Fellowship and the prize of the European Mathematical Society. And his mathematical research um, deals very often with asymptotic representation theory and its links in particular to probability theory, including random matrices and also systems that have certain types of integrable structures. And I think we're going to hear much more about this now. So, Alexei. Thank you very much for the introduction. It's a great honor for me to speak at this exciting and very enjoyable Congress. Um, the first thing that, that I want to do is to explain the title of my talk. Um, it says integrable probability. Both words, integrable and probability, are used a lot, but they're rarely used together. In fact, I don't think they had been used at all together until two years ago. And so the um, first two minutes, I'll try to explain what they're supposed to mean when used together. So for that, I suggest that we imagine a, um, a game that kids like to play, which is building a tower of blocks. Imagine a room with standard, bo bo standard blocks scattered around, and they're being put on top of each other. So once a few are set up, then the person looks for next one and puts it on top and so on. And uh, naturally, the time it takes to find the next block is random. And the question I'd like to ask is what should one expect for the height of the tower as the time goes on? I'm assuming that there are plenty of boxes, so the, there is no deficit. One doesn't need to go in the other corner of the room to find things. And so it's natural to assume that the average speed of growth of the tower should be constant. And so in the first approximation, the tower will have the height, which is linear in time, constant times time, but then there will be some fluctuations, depending on, I don't know what, but it's not gonna be exactly linear. So the question is, what can one say about the, the fluctuations? Now, of course, I haven't given you enough information to answer that question. The formulation is too vague, but maybe I gave you all the relevant information to really have the answer to the question. So how should one approach a problem like that? It's pretty natural, we do it a lot. I guess to look at the simplest example. What would be the simplest example? So to me, probably the simplest example would be to imagine that the time is discrete, and so every second, with probability half, we either put a new block on top or we don't put a new block on top. Right? It's pretty simple. And then, um, with a little bit of combinatorics, it's easy to compute exactly what's the probability to have um, a tower of a given height after a given time. It's given by the binomial coefficient normalized by the power of two. So that is good. We have a formula, and with a little bit of work, applying what's called Stirling's formula, one can get the behavior of the distribution as time becomes large. And so the answer is that um, if one subtracts the linear first term, then the fluctuations are given um, by what's called the Gaussian distribution, and the size of the, of, the fluctuation grows, of the fluctuations grows as the square root of t. This statement dates back a long time. It was proved by de Moivre, or appeared for the first time in the book by de Moivre in 1738. He was 71 years old at the time. It was generalized by Laplace in 1812. So it's a, it's a very old statement. What does it tell us about the original problem? Well, this is a specific example. Does, can we really infer something? 
And that's the, uh, the essence of what is sometimes referred as the universality principle. The answer to the problem of measuring the fluctuations, as probably everybody here knows, doesn't depend on the details of the randomness of how one puts the blocks in. As long as the times that one takes to put a new block are independent or reasonably independent, the answer is going to be the same. And so whatever we can read from the example, both the rate of the growth and the distribution that one gets, the Gaussian distribution, the bell-shaped curve, will apply much more generally. This is the subject of the central limit theorem that people study in their first classes on probability. But it took much longer to actually prove that theorem. It was formulated by Chebyshev in the end of 19th century and then proved by his students, Markov and Lupinov, a few years after. So what integrable probability is about is finding those examples, like the binomial dif uh, distribution that, that I showed, that can be analyzed and that would predict the behavior of a broader class of problems, or models, or probabilistic systems, that for whatever reason we are not able to access in the way that central limit theorem does for the tower of blocks. There are plenty of such, and to give examples, the first thing I'm going to do is to increase the space dimension from zero to one. So the, um, the pictures on this slide uh, are about many towers of blocks that are put next to each other in a row. And the first, the, the leftmost point of panel is um, a simulation of box, boxes being put in those towers in the situation when the uh, towers don't talk to each other. So the columns are independent. So we just replicate the, the zero dimensional model many times. And so we know everything about that picture just because we understand the previous one. Now the second one involves something that's uh, often referred as relaxation. There is a little bit of interaction. When a box falls, it looks around one unit to the left, one unit to the right, it finds the lowest possible position of the three, and it lands there. Now you see the simulation, it looks a little bit different, doesn't it? The third model is another possibility to introduce interaction between the towers. Namely, the boxes are sticky, and so when they're falling, they're going to stick to the first block they meet, which could be on the bottom or on the side, on the left and on the right. Then you look at the simulation and it also looks a little different from the first two. It's very easy to, to run this thing on the computer and ask the computer to measure the size of the, of the fluctuations. And so the computer is gonna say, of course, in the first case is square root of t, that's because it's just the central limit theorem. In the second case, it's going to be t to the quarter. In the third case, it's going to be t to the one third. And you can see the roughness of the border is different. The leftmost one is the roughest one, the next one is the rightmost, and then the middle one is the one that's smooth. How about trying to understand how one gets that? I'll, I'll say up front, nobody knows how to prove this fact for the rightmost model. It's out of our reach. But it's quite appealing, at least to understand what's happening there. So physicists, um, when they look at these models, these are models of uh, propagating interfaces, they, write to, to, they like to write equations with random terms that are supposed to describe a similar situation. These equations are, are written um, in the corresponding columns. I'm not gonna use them much, but I'll comment a little bit. So the leftmost one is, is boring, so I'll go to the next one. Um, there is a second derivative term that's supposed to be responsible for um, the relaxation. And then in the third equation, you see there is an additional uh, nonlinear term that brings the, the dependence of the speed of the growth of the interface on the slope. So here, h is the function whose plot is the interface, and the derivative in time is the, the vertical speed of growth of the interface. So the, um, the equations have, the na they have names. The middle one is called Edward Wilkinson equation and it describes a simpler situation. It's a linear equation, it can be solved. 
And the, um, the equation in the third column was introduced by three physicists, Kardar, Parisi, and Zhang, in 1986. And you might have seen this equation already in the presentations of, uh, of Ferze Tuni and Martin Heyer. Um, so what these equations do, they really provide another model of surface, of interface growth that is supposed to behave in a way similarly to the discrete models that are on the slide. In some way, they are simpler. In some way, they are more complicated. For example, it's not obvious that the equation with nonlinearity makes sense at all. And one of the spectacular corollaries of the theory that Martin Heyer constructed is the fact that this equation is well posed. In other words, there is a canonical way to assign a meaning to the word solution of this equation. But that's not something that, I, that, that we'll be interested in for this talk. What we're interested in is to understand the large time behavior of models of this type. Now before I, I go into some sort of mathematics, which I guess I'm supposed to do, I'll do one more step into physics, a little deeper. So um, this slide is supposed to convince you that you've probably seen the APZ equation in your life many times. So the leftmost picture on top is a coffee stain. So this is what happens to coffee when it's spilled on the hard countertop and that not cleaned up for a little bit of time. The feature of the stain that I want to point out is the dark rim. You see the border of the stain is dark. I don't, I'm not sure you paid attention to that. If that happens to tea, it's not going to be dark. That has to do with the fact that, that coffee is a colloidal suspension. The coffee particles are much larger than uh, the uh, water molecules. And so when um, the liquid dries, then the particles get packed to the border of the domain occupied by coffee originally. And the packing process under good microscope is pictured in the top row too. This is not the actual coffee. The problem with the actual coffee is that coffee particles are very irregular. They can be of different sizes and shapes and so on. This is manufactured coffee, not actually coffee. These are just particles that form a colloidal suspension. And so one can look at the video and measure how the roughness of the border changes with time. And the interesting fact is that if the particles are perfectly round, are perfectly round then the uh, fluctuations of the border of size root t, as time actually one needs to take the height of the packed layer on the border. And one observes the central limit theorem type behavior, the um, Gaussian distributions and things like that. On the other hand, if the particles are slightly elongated, the, ellips the ellipsoids with aspect ratio of something like 1.2, then the, um, there is a t to the one third appearing and the statistics one can read for the fluctuations is actually quite similar to the ones that, that correspond to the third column over there. Okay, so I'll leave the experimental evidence alone and I'll get back to the philosophy that I'm trying to preach, which is we don't know how to do the problem. Let's try to look for an example in which we know how to do things because the behavior is, is expected to hold for a variety of problems that have certain common features. I'll get back to, the, to those common features a little bit later. What's on the slide now is, is uh, probably the simplest example of a model in the KPZ, the kardar parisi zhang universality class, known as the totally asymmetric simple exclusion process. That's a long name. Um, that's usually abbreviated to TASEP, and that's how I will refer to but it's an easy model, growth model to explain. So the growing interface is formed by um, that broken black line with um, segments of slope one and minus one and of integer lengths. And then the dynamics is that the holes that one has in that interface, so at each local minimum, one can add a standard one by one box. And that happens independently at all possible locations with, let's say, exponential waiting time. Or maybe if the time is discrete with probability half at every, at every second. 
The, this, this model also has a nice interpretation in terms, in terms of traffic. Let me say what it is. It's, it's um, at least amusing. So if you project that interface onto the horizontal line beneath, and then we project um, segments of slope one to nothing, and segments of slope minus one to particles, then the whole interface is encoded by the configuration of particles, the one-dimensional lattice. And as time goes, that system evolves by, rule, by the rule that each particle tries to jump to the right, independently of the others, with some waiting time, which is random. And it does that if the place where it tries to land is empty. And if that place is occupied, then the jump doesn't happen. It's one of the simplest models of um, traffic on a one-lane highway. When cars move, there is some, if there is a gap in front of you, there is some possibility that you will speed up and close that gap. But if there is a car in front of you, probably you don't want to, to slam into it, right? So there is a, um, there is actually a simulation. And if my computer cooperates, I'll, I'll, I'll show you how that, that looks. So let's see. Here we go. So there is a particular initial condition when all the, par all the cars are parked on the left in initially, or in terms of the interface, the initial interface is a wedge. And so as time goes, you see that the, the wedge is being filled with things. That's the growth model. And so uh, you can uh, speed it up, and then of course it runs away. But then I can zoom in, I mean zoom out, and then I want to kill this thing. Um, and then you see that this interface growth. The first thing you notice is that there is a smooth curve that, that approximates it pretty well. That smooth curve is actually a parabola that touches the wedge on both sides. And then the, there, are, there are fluctuations around it. So that's how it looks. And then uh, I'll go back to the slides. So the first thing we see, the limit shape. That's actually pretty well understood. That's called the hydrodynamic behavior of this particular interacting particle system. And so um, the statement is that with a, broadly, with a broad class of initial conditions at large times, the first time behavior is deterministic. It's not random. Um, it's a plot of some function. And that function in time evolves according to an equation. It's a partial differential equation that's written um, on the slide, it's called uh, inviscid Berger's equation, or sometimes people call it shock equation. So this equation can be solved by characteristics and it develops shocks, which means that smooth initial conditions may turn into non-smooth ones, which all of us know, because these are traffic jams. The, um, if, if the roads are, have enough cars, they tend to develop traffic jams for no apparent reason. Okay. So um, that's good, but that's not really what, what, what I'm after because it's the fluctuation behavior that is supposed to be universal or shared by a large class of models. And so for the fluctuations behavior, I'm going to quote the first result that was actually proven for growth models in this particular universality class. Let me tell you what I'm doing. So I'm, I'm considering the same initial data. So originally all cars are packed on the left. Then there is a snapshot on the top right, which um, shows the, the parabola and the interface near the parabola. So if I go in, I zoom in by uh, time to the power one third vertically, which is what it's supposed to be, and time to the uh, power two thirds horizontally, then it turns out that the difference between the two will have a limit. That limit can be completely described and the statement that, that's below is the description of the one point distribution. So that's the distance between the random and non-random interface along any vertical section. Well, I took the middle vertical section here, but the answer is not going to depend on the section. The right hand side is the limiting distribution and it's not normal. So of course the first thing when one computes some limit in distribution, the, the default expectation it's normal because so many things in, in everywhere are normally distributed. In this case it's not. The distribution actually had a reason before this analysis was done, a few years before, and it originated from random matrix theory. It has the name of the Tracy, of it now it's called the tracy Widom distribution of, of for GUE or for the largest eigenvalue of um, 
Gaussian emission matrices. And I'll say in, in a few words how it came up, what its, or, what, what its origin is. Now it came up from um, random matrices, from what's called the Gaussian unitary ensemble of random matrices. Unitary actually refers to the symmetry group. This is an ensemble of emission matrices that's invariant under conjugation by unitaries with a Gaussian measure. And saying that, that the measure is Gaussian is essentially the same as saying that the real and imaginary parts of, of matrix elements are independent, identically distributed whenever they can be, modulo the self, self adjointness constraint. So this ensemble was introduced by Eugene Wigner a long time ago in 1950s. And the reason he looked at that is that he was hoping to model the statistical behavior of uh, energy levels for heavy nuclei, like uranium, for neutron resonances. There was a lot, a lot of experimental data that came up. Um, there were many resonance levels. It was unclear how to explain them. The model is too difficult to solve explicitly. And so Wigner came up with the idea that one should assume that the Hamiltonian is random. That was a spectacular success, actually. The, 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 um, the histograms that experiments gave were explained in, that, in this fashion. But it took 40 years, for, so that was done for the eigenvalues that lie in the bulk of spectrum. So the spectrum of random matrix spreads out, and if one looks in the bulk, then uh, um, it's the behavior in the bulk that uh, has some relation to the high energy physics. But it's the edge behavior that has the relation to the models I'm talking about. And so if one takes the largest eigenvalue, subtracts the expectation, and divides by um, uh, the variance, then, then the distribution that one gets at the end is uh, what's called the tracy widen distribution for GUE. It's not easy to write a formula for it. Actually, the, whatever formulas you can get are pretty complicated. And it's easier to say that uh, it comes from a solution of a, of a differential equation. It's a deceivingly simple differential equation. It's a second order nonlinear ordinary differential equation. It actually has a name. It's called a second Penleve equation. It has wonderful properties of its own, but it would take me too far to talk about that, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave that aside. One can also do this, uh, the same thing, for, not for um, emission matrices, but for real symmetric matrices. Put a Gaussian measure look at the largest eigenvalue, see the fluctuation behavior, then one gets a different distribution. That's also, that was also now done by Tracy and Widom. It's called the GOE, Gaussian Orthogonal Ensemble um, Distribution. Okay, so, so back, back to TASEP, back to my particles, so our interface is growing. This is a um, brief collection of results for different initial conditions for TASEP. So the, the first line is uh, the initial condition that I started with, the densely packed initial condition, or the wedge one if you want to look at the interface. And there, as I said, the fluctuations are given by the GUE um, edge distribution. Now the second line refers to what would be natural to call a flat initial condition. So that's when, when, when the interface originally looks flat. In terms of cars or in terms of particles, that means that one has a particle two holes, a particle, two holes, a particle, two holes, and so on. It's quite different from the packed initial condition because there, particles start to unpack slowly. Here, particles can move immediately everywhere. So what, what's happening with the fluctuations? It turns out that the exponent t to the one-third, the size of the fluctuation stays the same, but the distribution of the distance between the random and non-random interface is different. This is the um, GOE Tracy Widom distribution. And so one is wondering, where is the universality? It's supposed to be that, you know, it, at least in one model, when you pick different initial conditions, you should get the same thing. So the current belief is the universality is, is still there, and this is just a, a nuisance. This is a small caveat. So the general conjecture that one has here is that one, when one looks at the, at the growth of the interface, then whenever the hydrodynamic profile or the limit shape is curved, then near curved part, one has the GUE fluctuations, and near the flat part, one has the GO, GOE fluctuations. And so the bottom, the bottom picture is for the half-flat initial condition when the interface develops both the curved part and the flat part, 
And then the curved part, the, the fluctuations are the GUE ones and the flat one, the GOE ones. That's supposed to happen for a broad class of models. What exactly is the broad class of models? I have so far avoided asking that question. So here is a description. It's almost a definition. There has to be three features that the model has. One is the locality of growth. So if one has an interface, then it's supposed to grow independently at distant parts. Right, that's natural. The second one is that there has to be some sort of a smoothing mechanism. So we shouldn't allow deep holes to develop or high peaks. There should be no fractal type behavior. So that can be achieved by, by different uh, means. Uh, as you've seen before, there is a relaxation when the falling box travels around and fills the hole it finds. Or in the case of TASEP, it's because the interface has slow plus, no more than plus and minus one that forbids deep holes. But that feature has to be inside. And there is, a, there is a third one. The interface should really go sideways. So if you see a droplet, it really should grow sideways. Now more constructively, it means that the vertical speed of growth should depend on the local slope. And if one has all three, then the prediction is that one really has to see the same type of behavior for what, whatever model you choose. It's interesting to go back to, to the three examples that, that, that I had and sort of uh, see what fails. Um, so in the first one, uh, well, it's a boring example anyway, but there is no smoothing mechanism. And um, well, it's in general a sort of a lower dimensional example. In the, in, in the second example, the smoothing mechanism is clearly present, but there is no dependence on the, of the speed of growth on the local slope. Now what it means is that if you pick any horizontal segment and look at how many boxes fall down that segment, then it's not going to depend on the details of your interface. It's always approximately constant. The boxes don't travel far. They always stay where they fall. And now in the, in the, in the third example, there is really a lateral growth. If you imagine the initial condition that's very sloped, then the boxes will grow sideways and though, and which will be very different from when you start with the flat. So that's the one that's in KPZ class. Okay, so TASEP is an integrable example and it was really used to understand what's supposed to happen for the whole class. That was the first model that was accessed to a large amount of detail. And by now there are more. So TASEP was solved using uh, what physicists would say are free fermions and mathematicians use different terms, determinantal point processes on intersecting paths. Sure process is another, is another name. And the same method gives more models. The same method gives uh, TASEPs with discrete time. Um, the so-called push, push ASEP or push TASEP, that's where the, the, the interaction is when particles jump. If the particle tries to jump and then there is somebody in front, that, that particle just pushes that car over, a little bit root version of, of TASEP. And then there are also percolation and polynuclear growth type models with some specific integrable um, distributions involved. I'm not going to describe them. If you've seen them, you probably know what I'm talking about, but I'll move on. I'll be happy to explain at the end of the talk if, if anybody wants. Now, so um, most recently, in the last five years or so, there was a breakthrough. And so there is a, a, a new class of models in the KPZ class. Um, that are not solvable by free fermions of determinants. They are much harder. They're still solvable. They're still integrable, but by different tools. And so those include, for example, um, ASEP. So that's the same as TASEP. Particles jump left, well, but now particles jump, jump left and right with different speeds. And again, if they meet somebody, then they just don't go. Right? So that's a much harder model to, to study, but it was analyzed. KPZ equation itself ends up being a model in the KPZ universality class. And for certain initial conditions, one can write down the solutions explicitly and analyze them to a great level of detail. Then there is a Q deformation of TASEP in um, certain uh, polymer models. And the most recent one that, that was accessed is the so-called six vertex model, sometimes also called square ice model in, in um, statistical mechanics because its states could be thought of as collections of um, 
water molecules that are frozen on, on a, a square grid. And so I could have easily given the talk, the rest of the talk, and two more talks on the, um, on these models and explaining how they uh, work together and what's the same, what's different, and so on. But that's not what I want to do with the, with the remaining time. What I want to do in the remaining time is to try to increase the dimension, the space dimension by one more. So um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to look at the interfaces in three space built from one by one by one cubes without holes and, and overhands. So these are examples of, of interfaces that I want to, to look at. And of course, the most natural way to put a dynamics on them, especially since we've just seen TASEP, is to imagine that when you see such an interface, then you want to put a single one by one by one box in every possible location, independently with some random waiting time. That's a natural thing to do. One can run it on a computer, see what happens. The trouble is nobody knows what happens. There is no information that people have about this growth, nothing. One can clearly see the limit shape develops. What is that limit shape for at least one initial condition? Nobody knows. What's the equation according to which it's supposed to grow? Nobody knows. What's the fluctuation rate? Well, people measure with numerical simulations. They say this is t to a power. The power is 0 0.24. And they swear that it's not a quarter. So then why am I talking about this? There are indications that maybe there is something to be found here that's more tangible, or more integrable than the, the, the naive heat bath dynamics that I just suggested. And so that's, that's what I'll, I'll talk about. I'm not sure, maybe some of you have noticed the, the three pictures there is actually the same piece of the surface viewed from different angles. Not too obvious from the beginning. Anyway, so the hint that there must be something integrable comes from the results from approximately a decade ago that uh, don't have any dynamics in it, but that uh, they have the random surfaces of this type and the limit shapes, the behavior is algebraic, which is really the sign that there is something solvable happening. I'll explain the leftmost picture there. One should imagine a large room like this one, empty, and then one takes a corner and one takes a million one by one boxes and packs them into that corner. What is it gonna look like? Well, of course, it depends how you pack them. Well, you pack, you do it randomly, and randomly here means that I put a uniform measure on all possibilities to pack them. There's a zillion possibilities. And if one draws something randomly, then one sees a limit shape. And that limit shape actually is, is, is pretty nice. It's um, two-dimensional projection as, as written, um, as, as drawn, has a, has a nice name in, the, in real algebraic geometry. It's called the amoeba of a complex line. And one can describe completely what the answer is. The, the second picture is um, a similar thing in the room with um, three corners, I believe, a few more corners. And so you can imagine that this is really dust accumulating in the corners of the room, that one is not, one is not cleaning. It's also an amoeba of a, of a more complicated algebraic curve. And the third one um, is a little harder to imagine three-dimensionally. It's certain boundary conditions that, again, one uses to put a uniform distribution, all possibilities to put a random surface there. And the, uh, the curve that bounds the chaotic region into the middle is actually a cardioid. So can one really grow these things? They are nice, they algebraic, maybe there is a recipe to build them up. I'll come back to that question. For now, let me introduce a, 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 a growth model in, in two plus one dimensions that is integrable. So that's a model for which one can prove things, and I'll, I'll say a little later which things one can prove. So I'll start with the initial condition, which is uh, empty. So I'm imagining, uh, so on the left, there is a picture that this is just really a, an, an open book. It's just an, an, em an empty corner, two, two planes meeting at the right angle. And on the right um, is uh, the way uh, it's pleasant for me to imagine that thing. I'm gonna project it on the flat picture. Um, 
I hope you see that the two correspond to each other. And then in, in um, rhombi that are vertical, in vertical orientation, I'm going to put particles. Because similarly to TASEP, there are two ways to describe the model, either three, either geometrically by putting things on, to, on top of the interface or as jumping particles. And both are useful, and I'll start with jumping particles. So to imagine how this thing grows, I have to um, put the hierarchy on the particles. So this is really saying that um, the bottom particle is the most important one. It's going to move according to its own rules and not pay attention to anybody else. Then the two particles on top only will pay attention to the big boss, but they're not going to care about the particles upstairs and so on. And so what the particles are going to do, they're going to jump to the right independently, let's say with exponential waiting times, except for there are rules. Because if you just allow to move them without any respect to each other, then the picture would not be interpretable as a surface. There is re really an interlacing constraint. Between every two particles on the same horizontal level, between two neighbors, there has to be one particle below exactly in between them. So the rule is when the particle tries to jump to the right, if it has a contradiction with the particle below, the jump is forbidden. You have to respect the boss. And if the contradiction is with the particle with above, then you just push it over. No respect for, for lower particles. So this is the, the example of a, of a, of a few, of few first steps. I know for the fact that um, the audience is split into two groups, which see three-dimensionally these pictures in a different way, either with boxes being added to the picture or with boxes being removed from the picture. I'll take the point of view that the box is being added. You can try to switch your view in the next 30 seconds or so. It's not trivial, but with some effort you can do it. Okay, so originally in terms of particles on the left, on, uh, on the left picture, only the particles that are not filled, so the, the right edge can move because everybody else can, is, is blocked by lower, neighbor, lower neighbors and so they can't move. And so the red one is the one that, let's say, it's the first one to move. Its clock ran first, it moves, it pushes over two particles on top of it because they stand in its way, and then the next one red moves, doesn't push anybody, the next one red, uh, um, red jumps and it moves one, and so on. Three-dimensionally what it means is that, at least in the three-dimensional connotation that I'm imagining, is that one is adding um, directed sticks. So instead of adding one by one by one boxes, I'm adding one by one by something sticks. And I do it in all possible ways so that I don't create any overhangs, and they, they, it's, it happens independently with um, exponential waiting time. So again, I, I can show the, uh, um, the simulation, hopefully. So this is uh, the same thing except for it's, uh, well, under a fine transformation, let's put it this way, and with some colors. And so that's um, how the dynamics starts. For some reason on this picture, it's really easier for me to imagine that the boxes are being removed. But again, there are two possible connotations. So you see that there are sticks that are being removed one, one by one. And so I started with a particular initial condition, and so if I, if I speed things up, if I uh, speed things up, then you see that um, it grows. And uh, it, the, uh, the surface will really approach a, um, a, smooth, a smooth interface, as I will say a little later. And one can really understand something about it. So at least one thing that's easy to formulate is going back to the question of, um, well, before going back to that question, let me make a connection with the, uh, with the previous, with, with the TASEP story. So if I just look at the leftmost particle, so in each row I pick the leftmost particle, then the uh, restriction of the dynamics to those particles is the TASEP, the one that we started with. There is no pushing in those particles, they just, they're just being blocked. And if one restricts to the rightmost particles, then it's also independent dynamics. It's push TASEP. The particles just push, they're never blocked. And then finally in the middle, so not in the middle, if one looks along the horizontal row, the dynamics along the horizontal row is actually um, also Markovian. It's independent. Well, it can be thought of as being independent of everything else. And its large time behavior is the same as that of eigenvalues of, of GUE matrices if one makes the matrix elements do the Brownian motion. 
All right. So a very similar, this is one example, and very similar dynamics can be used to grow, um, to grow these pictures that I've shown you before. These are snapshots of, of the dynamics, but I thought it may be more fun to, to actually see the little cartoon how, how this happens. So this is the, the type of the, of the interface that I'm, that I'm talking about. And so what the dynamics is going to do is going to change the, the support. So these are um, surfaces built in a box, so it's like a room in which there are boxes, and the distribution or the weight of a picture like that is Q raised to the volume, or Q raised to the number of boxes. This is almost equivalent, actually asymptotically equivalent to just considering a uniform measure on all possibilities with a prescribed number of boxes. So um, the way the dynamics works is that it changes the shape of the room in this particular case. And in particular, what, what it will do if I proceed, it will flatten the room completely and make the picture into nothing. So if I start back from, from, this, from this configuration, then I can actually grow the picture. Right? It's a simple dynamics. The computer is actually doing that in real time. This is not a movie. You can also do various things. You can you know, go back and forth and see what happens. Now it's a little, it's a little more impressive when you increase the size. So uh, let me increase the size and, and, and show you something. Here you really see how changing the, the shape grows that, that amoeba. That, that, that limit face, that, uh, that limit shape that appears. And you'll see when, when the box gets sufficiently large, then the boundary conditions actually stop influencing the behavior, something like that. So this is, this is the dynamical growth of the picture that, they, uh, that, that I've showed before, the, the amoeba of the complex line. And I'll, I'll show one more picture. So this is, um, um, this is the picture with a different value of Q, actually. This picture corresponds to Q being one. So this picture is, is going to grow um, surfaces that are uniformly random. So o over all possibilities to put unit cubes in the room, one chooses a uniformly random one. And so you see the size of the room is changing, and so is the picture. And when one looks at that picture, there is a natural conjecture one should be making. What's that curve that bounds the chaotic region from the non-chaotic one. It's always an ellipse inscribed into the hexagon. And that was one of the first results, the so-called arctic circle theorem by Con Larsen and Prop that was proved in, in 1998, I think. Okay. So um, I said that the, the models I'm talking about are integrable. What benefits does it give? It really gives a lot. It allows one to compute many things. So let me mention some. They're not computed for all the models one has. Um, but, it, well, fair a fair amount of them. Actually, I wanted to mention the simulations that I've shown are, uh, are done by, by Vadim Gorin, and if you go to his website, you can download the, the simulator and play with, with, with it yourself. It's a lot of fun. There are several tunable parameters, and you can get many effects happening on your screen. Not all of them have been understood theoretically. So. I enjoy it. Anyway, so the first statement is, of course, the law of large numbers behavior, the limit shape, the smooth one. And that's explicit. And moreover, it gov it's governed as it should be by the first order equation. With a particular right hand side, it can be solved by characteristics. So it's there. Now, what about the universality class? I said a few minutes ago that nobody can say anything about the dynamics of putting cubes into the holes. Not understood. Now, now I'm saying here is a model for which things are understood. Maybe by universality, that means that I can understand something there. There is a caveat here, an interesting one. The KPZ equation that's supposed to do things for you. In two dimensions, there are actually two equations. The, so there is an equation written on the board, the, um, uh, on, the, on the slide, the time derivative of h is equal to Laplace h plus the quadratic form in the gradient plus the noise. The quadratic form of the gradient in two dimensions has an invariant, which is the signature. If the, if the signs in front of two derivatives are equal, that's the isotropic case, and that corresponds to 
the cubes being put in all the holes. It's natural, right? The demand, the, there is no difference between directions. This case actually corresponds to the signature being one and minus one. The corresponding universality class is called the anisotropic KPZ, universality class. Interestingly enough, the equation itself doesn't really make sense. Mathematicians don't know what, how to make sense of solutions of such an equation. It's too singular. But the inability of mathematicians to make sense of objects never prevented physicists from working with those objects. And so in this particular case, there was a physicist named Wolf that many years ago did, so, did a formal procedure on the equation, something that physicists would call a one-loop expansion of the Renorm group action, that predicted that the nonlinearity non in this equation actually doesn't matter for long-time behavior. And if one removes the nonlinearity, it's a linear equation, one can solve it. It predicts that the fluctuations are of size log t, actually root of log t, which is much smaller than t to a power. So this kind of model hugs the smooth surface much, much closer. This ends up being correct, as integrable examples show. Of course, the universality statements are all conjectural. There is really no techniques that's beyond our reach to do any sort of universality statements rigorously for one plus one or for the two plus one situations. But there is some number of integrable examples that's a form of universality. Okay, so what I said is that if one uh, look, measures the distance transversally between the smooth and the stepped surface, then it has size root well, of the order root of log t, and the distribution actually is normal. The next question, the next natural question one should ask is what's the um, multipoint situation? I, I take the distance at different points, what do I get? So that, that's the picture. So this is the column deposition model, the one that I, I showed the colorful dynamics for, it's just it's colored differently here. And this, uh, on the right, there is a, this is the fluctuation field. Look at this fluctuation field, it doesn't look too nice. It's rough. It doesn't look like a function. It's actually not a function. It's a distribution in the end. It, it, the limiting object is the um, Gaussian generalized function. It's called the Gaussian free field. In order to see this Gaussian, so the Gaussian free field in two dimensions naturally lives on a complex domain, actually. So the definition on the complex domain is the following. One looks at, one takes the, the domain in the complex plane, takes the eigenfunctions of the Laplacian with a given boundary conditions, I take zero boundary conditions here, and then one writes the, the um, random series with eigenfunctions divided by root of eigenvalue multiplied by identically distributed Gauss. So this series actually diverges almost surely at every point, seems to be a meaningless thing. But if one averages it against test functions, then it gives meaningful answers. And that's the Gaussian free field. This is the fluctuation field for the models that I'm talking about. Um, in order to see it, one needs to do a non-trivial transformation, map the limit shape to a complex domain. It's not obvious where the complex coordinate is, it's really hidden. It's non-trivial, but once it's out, it becomes a prediction for all models in the anisotropic two plus one KPZ universality class. And the integrable examples, in particular the one that I showed you, was really the one that predicted the behavior. There are a few other examples where this, this has been done by now. Um, the Gaussian free field is really a remarkable object. It's conformally invariant. It's, it's related to many recent advances in probability. Um, SLEs in particular, and so maybe one could hope to bring the two things together, but that hasn't been done yet. Okay, so, so far, I pretended to be a probabilist. I phrased things in a probabilistic fashion, I spoke about limit theorems and so on, and so one could think that this is really the sort of the classical style probability, the subject I'm talking about. Well, not really true. So the approach to the um, results that I spoke about is largely algebraic. The models that I mentioned, they arrange themselves in hierarchies. Some are more general than others. And those hierarchies, they shadow the hierarchies from representation theory. 
the hierarchies of uh, multivariate special functions that arise in representation theory. Things like characters of unitary groups, the so-called um, true functions, or spherical functions for symmetric spaces over various fields, over RC, over finite fields, over functional fields. And the tools that come from representation theory are really the ones that allow us to get control over the probabilistic models. This is what actually gave mathematicians advantage over physicists in this particular situation. There is a lot of algebraic structure that lead to understanding the fine structure of the model. This is a part of the hierarchy um, of the models. I'll, I'll, I'll be um, rather brief. So sure functions um, that I mentioned, the characters of, of unity groups, give rise to sure processes that are at the bottom of this picture here. So sure processes include the free fermion models, the TASEP that I started with, the push TASEP, the GUE, last passage percolation with special weights and so on. The top box um, named McDonald processes, they are named after McDonald polynomials. These are multivariate symmetric polynomials invented by Ian McDonald in mid 80s. They depend on two parameters, Q and T. They're a remarkable object. These polynomials united many other cases or many other families of special functions arising in representation theory of different flavors. If you go one level down on the rightmost box, there are spherical functions for p-adic groups. On the leftmost box, there are representations of affine and quantum um, D groups, the algebras. In the middle, there are, there are spherical functions for Riemannian symmetric spaces. These objects don't really seem to be closely related in, in, in you know, when you see them by themselves, but they really come from the, the, the family, or at least the, the special functions that arise come from a single family that McDonald found. And so what I was talking about is essentially building a bridge that connects the representation theoretic setup and the probabilistic or physical setup, and that allows to carry the structure and the information that one can get in the representation theoretic setup to leverage for the information in, in, the, um, in the probabilistic setup. So just uh, to, to, to summarize what I was talking about, I um, try to argue that there are broad classes of uh, probabilistic systems, or models of random growth, that are conjectured mostly by physicists to have same asymptotic behavior. And uh, the treatment of these classes by mathematical tools are so f is so far beyond our reach. I don't think there are really ideas around of how to do that. However, in these classes, in some of them, one can find singular examples of models that carry additional structure. Probabilistic models are typically very fluid. You can modify a little bit the parameters, nothing is gonna change. These integrable examples are very sensitive to the change. They're very specific. And because of their algebraic structure, one can extract a very fine asymptotic behavior from them. By the conjectured universality principle, that really gives the full conjecture for all the models in, 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 in the corresponding um, class. And the way to, to think, one way to think about these models is that they are really projections of old algebraic or representation theoretic objects. And representation theoretic objects, on the other hand, are quite rigid. You can't deform them. There are only that many simple Lie groups. There is nothing else one can do. And so it's these objects projected through that bridge that I mentioned into the probabilistic world give the information on the, on the asymptotics. Okay, I um, tried to give an overview. I didn't really scratch the surface on, on the substance of, 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 the, of the subject. And so this would be the, the correct place for me to um, give the references. Now, luckily, and to my great pleasure in this Congress, I don't need to do that. I, I can do a much 
better thing. Namely, I can refer you to quite a few talks in this Congress that are directly related to various things that I spoke about. This afternoon, there are three talks that are very closely related. Um, Grigory Alshansky will talk about the representation theoretic problems that benefit from interaction with probability. That bridge that I mentioned, the information is not just being pushed one way, it can also travel in a different way. Really beneficial to representation theory as well. And then Timo Seppalainen and, and, and Sasha Sodin will talk about random polymers and random matrices and approaching them from a non-integrable standpoint that uh, they will talk about. And then there is also a, uh, um, a list of other talks. Some have passed already, some, some have not yet passed. And um, um, Ivan Corvin's talk that, that, that happened two days ago is really the closest one to to this one, it detailed some of the examples in the one plus one dimensional KPZ um, class. And um, if you're curious, you can look at his um, contribution. Um, and I highly recommend whatever talks haven't passed yet. These are all wonderful speakers, my friends and colleagues. And, and with this, I will conclude. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for a beautiful lecture. Uh, I think we have time for a couple of questions. You have mentioned about the traffic mode system. If the arrive rate is one, and then the departure rate is greater than one, then maybe the interface maybe it's some kind of balanced uh, uh, style. Because, yeah, if the, this is a gross model, and then if once uh, in the traffic system, also there are some departure. So you, you want the interface to decay rather than to grow? Uh, maybe balanced. Yeah, okay. Yeah, in the former Q system, if you uh, arrive rate is one, and then the, the uh, departure rate is maybe is a little bit greater than uh, one, and then the Phase should be uh, some, some kind of balanced uh, way uh, move on, uh, move okay. up and down. Yeah. So, um, as I understand the question, uh, I, I spoke about the interfaces that move in one direction. One can imagine that the interface may move both uh, up yeah, and down. Yeah, yeah. As, the as departure, it happens, departure is, uh, uh, the part is involved. As, as it happens, for example, for TASEP, when particles both jump right and left. So um, if the particles jump right and left and the rates of those jumps are different, then it's uh, not going to change the universality class. But if the rates of jumping right and left are the same, which means that the speed of adding boxes is the same as the speed of removing boxes, then it turns out that the roughness of the interface changes. It's gonna be t to the quarter, and that's in line with the Edward Wilkinson universality class that I mentioned. I'm hoping I answered the question. Yeah, I, I mean, the, this is a growth rate. Another is the departure is at the bottom, maybe the uh, uh, quicker, quicker, quicker release rate. Then the, the surface maybe is, uh, should be up and down. In the form, in the form king system, they, they behave in, that, like in this way. This is, of course, the tree-like uh, tree -like input system in this, this, in this case. Well, maybe, maybe yeah, we can yeah, discuss we can afterwards. This, yeah. I'm Thank not you. sure I understand understanding the question. Yeah. Is there any other question? So you mentioned uh, integral processes. How do you know which processes are integrable and which are not? How do you distinguish them? Great question. How do you know whether the process is integrable or not? So historically, the way it happened is that um, people stumbled upon integrable processes. You know, they looked at different models, and some models are better than others. You know, when one looks at interacting particles, TASIP is a fairly natural system. It was introduced, actually, in 1968, I think, for totally different reasons. And so, with time, they learned how to analyze them, and there was a lot of structure there. So there is sort of this ad hoc searching process. On the other hand, with the bridge that, that, that I was mentioning, what one can do is one can take the representation theoretic structures, that's what we have been doing, that's a lot of fun, and push them through that bridge and see what kind of probabilistic systems one ends up with. 
You don't know a priori which universality class you will end in. You don't know a priori what kind of probabilistic model you're going to see. And actually in the, well, okay, that was removed. In the boxes in this um, sort of um, scheme that I showed, you can see there random objects like random matrices over finite fields with specific distributions or um, the polymers or random or random matrix ensembles with some specific features. And so those are really the images that come from the representation theoretic structure. So um, as far as I can see, you can either search from the grassroots somehow, some, from time to time you find a flower that, that has more properties than, than the rest, or you can come from the other side. You can come from the representation theoretic side and build representation, uh, probabilistic models that will a priori be integrable already and have a lot of structure. And then you can try to see what that gives you probabilistically. So I'm afraid that we have to close the session now. So let's thank Alexei again for a beautiful and inspiring lecture.